tonight. It's a Wednesday night. You're in the house. I'm proud of you. You're online. I'm proud of you tonight. And the situation or the fight that you're in right now, it could be that no one else in this room understands what you're going through. And maybe you've gotten to the point right now, maybe you've gone so far, you feel like you've come far from God, you feel like your fire's dwindled, maybe you feel like you've plateaued, maybe you feel like most of your days are spent in depression, in anxiety, in hopelessness, and all of these things maybe are starting to rule your days as you go on. Now I know I'm speaking to somebody in this place today, but I got very, very good news for you tonight. That whatever it is that you're in right now, you do not have to stay there. Because whatever fight you're facing, Jesus already won that fight. He paid for it on the cross. And what Jesus did on the cross was intended to set you free. So now, now whatever fight you're in, whatever storm you're facing, you can say these words, I trust in God. I trust him because he fought the fight I couldn't win. I trust him because he rescued me from the darkness that was overcoming me. I trust him because when I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, he does. And my life is in his hands and I have nothing I have to worry about. So we could sing, I trust in God to sing. My Savior, Come on church, now's the time to stir it up. We sing, I trust in God. His praises. Fail. He will never fail. Come on and give the Lord some praise in His place tonight. Come on, if you're saying I'm done trusting in my own circumstance, I'm done trusting in the problems, I'm done trusting in my bank account, I'm done trusting in my own relationships. I'm done trusting in the doctor's report. I'm done trusting in those things. But tonight I'm saying, I trust in the Lord. I trust Him. He's going to get me through the storm. Come on, somebody give God some praise in His place tonight. We trust you, Lord. We trust in you, Jesus. He's here tonight. He's here for you. He has a word for you. He has promises for you. When you think you've gone too far for God's reach, you're actually believing in a lie the enemy's told you. The truth is this. No one is too far gone for God's reach. He can go in the darkest pit, in the darkest valley, in the darkest place and snatch you out of the pit of hell. Tonight he has a word and he has a plan for someone in this place. Come on, I wish I had at least five, six people that would just say, God, I trust in you. Come on, listen.
let's give God some praise tonight. One more shout of praise to the King. He's faithful. He's good. Who's excited to be in the house of God on a Wednesday night? No better place to be. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for being here. Those that are online right now, we're so grateful for what God is doing. I believe God has a word for us tonight, and he's going to speak to all of us. So why don't we go before the Lord and pray. Father, right now, we humble ourselves before your word. God, we're not here for hype. We're not here for a show. We're here to receive your power, your word, your instructions. So God, as we open the Bible to hear what you have to say, we ask God that you would speak directly to us personally. Father, right now, I pray that you would speak through me. I humble myself before you. It's not my opinion, it's your word because in your word is life. We thank you for it and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we all say, amen. All right, give your neighbor a high five and take your seat. Tell them I'm so excited to see you in church tonight. God is so good, isn't he? Well, welcome to service tonight. My name is Pastor Christian. I am the campus pastor here. And I'm just honored to be able to bring the word to you guys tonight. I believe God has a word for us. I believe he's going to speak directly to us. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to open the Bible. And we're going to go through scripture of what God has to say. And on Wednesday night, something that we do is really cool. Is we actually go verse by verse through the chapter of the Bible that we're studying as a church. Right now, we are studying the book of Matthew. And the passage of scripture that we're going to study is Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. So if you have your Bibles on you, if you got an actual Bible, shout out to Real Life Bibles. If you got a, if you got an iPad Bible, that's what's up too. Hey, the word is the word. But it, it turn with me to Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read this really quick, and then we're going to break this down. It says... Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Really, Pharisees, you're concerned about them washing their hands? Okay, let's keep going. So Jesus replies, and why do you? So he, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees now. Why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say you don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Ooh, some say ouch. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. But what we're going to talk about tonight, the title of the message is tonight, is this. The gospel versus religion. There's a difference between religion and the gospel. Religion, you may be thinking, well, I thought Christianity was a religion. I thought this was one of the religions that are available in the world. Well, religion actually is this. It's a system of man-made rules and regulations that people attempt to follow in order to make themselves right with God. Religion is trying to get, to get to God by excluding Jesus. Religion says that I can perform well enough so that God will accept or approve of me, but I can do it, do so, while having no relationship with Jesus. Religion, newsflash, does not work. But the gospel, on the other hand, the gospel says this. The gospel is the good news message 
that Jesus paid a price that we could not pay so that we can inherit eternal life, something we did not earn. It was something that, that it, it, the, the gospel is this, you deserve to pay the price, but Jesus did it for you. You don't deserve the good blessings or the things of God, but he gives them to you anyway. This is the gospel. It doesn't make any sense, but it's good, good news for people that need a savior. So religion, on one hand, says this. You must perform in order to get, be loved by God. But, but the gospel says this. Jesus performed so that you can be loved by God. Religion, you're totally dependent on yourself, but in the gospel, you're totally dependent on Jesus. In religion, what happens is it just works on the outside, putting a mask or makeup on the filth that's within. But the gospel begins to renew what's on the inside so that what comes out is beautiful. Religion worships the acceptance of others. Religion says, I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. I want people to know and think that I'm good. But the gospel worships only one person. It's the name of Jesus. And we worship Jesus, the one who has accepted us, even in our darkest moment. Religion says, tries to win the approval of God. But the gospel says, you're already approved through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Religion works from the outside in, but the gospel works from the inside out. Religion only focuses on your abilities, but the gospel focuses on Jesus Christ. So you're wondering, what is the whole deal? What's the deal with religion and the gospel? Why can't I be a religious person? Well, the, the reality is the Pharisees in this portion of scripture, they were those religious leaders. And these religious leaders, they were so in love with their own man-made rules that they honored their tradition sometimes more than they honored God and his word. So they put their own man-made up stuff above God's word. And they compared this, this not washing of hands. They even, they, they, they compared their own man-made idea of not washing hands to a, 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 a person even sleeping with a harlot or a prostitute. They said, if you don't obey our little rules, it's, it's, it's as extreme as that. Now, this whole washing of the hands, it came from their own traditional rules. It, it did not even come from Scripture. It was something that they kind of made up along the way. But Jesus, he speaks to them pretty harshly. He calls them hypocrites. He challenges them. And he accuses the religious leaders of putting their made-up traditions over direct obedience to God. Yeah, and he calls them hypocrites because they start creating loopholes. The religious leaders started creating loopholes so that they can appear religious, so that they can look godly, but in reality, they do not, they do not have to change or obey God. It's like, it's like finding a loophole in your taxes. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm in, I didn't mean to bring that up right now. <laughs> Jesus calls their hypocrisy, he even says this, that their worship is a farce. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You know basically what he's saying? They have fake worship to God. And he quotes Isaiah 29, 13 when he says this. Here's a quote I, said, I read from a commentary. It says, it's easy to want to be impressed by the image of being near to God without really doing it with our heart. It's easy to want to be impressed by the image, the look. I can look religious. I can look godly. I can look very Christian without actually wanting to do this from your heart. That's the temptation I think a lot of us can have. We can come to church and dress up. We can wear the suit and the tie. Nothing wrong with wearing suit and a tie. But we do these things so we can look godly. But God is saying, but where is your heart? See, God, the Bible says this, men may look at the outward appearance, but God right now is looking at your heart. You dressed up for church and people can see your nice outfit. So you got the jacket on, you got the shirt on, and you're like, man, I'm going to look good at church. And God's like, yeah, 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 that's great and all, but I'm looking at your heart. I want to see what's dressed in your heart. I want to see what's going on in your heart. I want to see what's happening inside of your heart. And this is what God is focused on in our lives. Some of us can dress so well, we can, we, can, we can drive the best car, we can have the greatest business, we can raise the best network, we can do all these fancy things, but God is not concerned about those things just so as much as he's concerned about where the, the condition of your heart is. 
So the question now is, where is your heart? I got the first point for you tonight, which is that religion cannot save you. Your right standing with God is not based on your performance. Whether God accepts you or loves you, it's not based on how good you can perform for him. You're not, you're not some performer for God. You're not auditioning to get into heaven. You're not going through auditions and God's going to score you and say, you know, I didn't really like the performance all that well. The way you were singing at church, it was kind of a little off tune there. And uh, you didn't lift both hands. You only lift one with the other one in the pocket. Uh, if you would have lift both, maybe you would have made the cut, but you didn't quite make it. Religion, performance, all these things, they cannot save you. They will not save you. And one of the enemy's greatest weapons is to base your identity on your performance. The devil wants you to think that you can perform for God's love. The devil wants you to think that if you do, if you check off every box and cross every T and dot every I and do everything that's necessary, that you will earn and win the love and approval of God. It can't happen. You know what else the enemy is tricky at? He's very good at. He's very good at causing you to identify with your worst moments. The devil wants you to call yourself based on the lowest moment you've had in your life. You fell, you stumbled, you've fallen. And the devil wants to accuse you and kick you while you're down. The Bible says in Revelation 12:10. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. Another name for the devil, another nickname he has is accuser. He's constantly accusing people. He's a professional accuser. It's his day job. It's what he does. And the devil, he's crazy. He has no shame, no shame in making you do something and then condemning you for doing it. The devil has no shame in leading you. Go ahead, it's not so bad. It's, not, it's gonna feel good. Oh, you did it? Oh, you're disgusting that you did that. This is the devil's tactic. He gets you, he entices you with temptation and then he condemns you once you've fallen. He's an accuser. And the devil wants you to begin to regurgitate or begin to say, say, speak exactly how he's speaking. And he wants you now to call and accuse yourself and shame yourself and condemn yourself for the things you've done. Some of you right now, you're not trapped because someone, uh, somebody is, is judging you or throwing stones at you. Some of you are trapped in a guilt cage that you made for yourself. Some of you are so full of shame and you constantly, every day and every night before you go to bed, you accuse yourself, you shame yourself, you put yourself down and you, and you beat yourself up for the mistakes that you've made. It's sad, but it's true that we do this to ourselves. And many of us are, 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 are wondering, how come I can't grow? How come I can't experience the love of God? How come, what is going, how come God doesn't love me? And God's saying, I do love you. If you would just learn to accept my love and my forgiveness and my grace and my power that I've given you. I didn't come, Jesus said, to condemn the world, but I came to save the world from their sin, from bondage, from the penalty of sin. So we need him. Satan says things like, look how you're living. You're not who God says you are. He gets us to believe these lies. And once he starts saying these lies and we believe them, this is where bondage and strongholds begin to take hold of our lives. But with Jesus, it's a lot different. With God, it's a whole another story. Because of the gospel, because of the good news of Jesus, he doesn't condemn you, but he offers you forgiveness and grace. He gives you, a, he gives you a new beginning and he will renew you from the inside out. This is what Jesus can do for us. So your right standing with God is based on Jesus, not your ability to obey the law. Philippians 3.9 says, I cannot be made right with God by what the law said I must do. I couldn't do it. I was made right with God by faith in Christ Jesus. Let's break this down a little bit. So when Jesus lived on this earth, 
Jesus obeyed the law to perfection. He was perfect. He was complete. The Bible says that he fulfilled the law. He had no mistakes. He aced the test of life. And he never sinned. So picture the law like an exam. The law is an exam, and you have to pass the exam 100% perfectly in order to inherit the kingdom of God. That means that, just imagine, every test you've ever taken in school, every quiz, every pop quiz from elementary school to high school to in middle school, every test you've ever taken, you would have to pass each of them 100% in order to inherit the kingdom of God. And if you made one mistake on one test, then you're blemished and you failed. Now it's impossible because we make a lot of mistakes. Someone say, amen, brother, that's me. I make a lot. But here's the reality. When we take the test, when we take this test of the law, when we see the law, all it does is reveal how sinful we really are. Some of you in high school or in middle school, whatever, when you took a test, all it did was show you weren't paying attention. Let's call it what it is. I did not do my homework. I don't know what's going on. I did not study. Like, I'm gonna, I, I, need, I need some answers. I need someone to pass me the answers here. How many cheaters do we have in the house? Don't lie, you cheated. <laughs> Man, you guys are honest. I love that. <laughs> the law, all it does, it just reveals the fact that you need somebody to save you. Because without a savior, you're doomed. The good news is that Jesus passed this test. Jesus aced the test. Every pop quiz, every test he faced in life, he passed it with flying colors. Not only did he pass the exam perfectly, but when he went to turn in the test, he wrote your name on it. This is what Jesus did. So you might say, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, isn't that cheating? Yes, it is cheating. As a matter of fact, you are cheating. You're cheating death. You're cheating destruction. You're cheating hell. You're cheating the penalty of your own sin. You're cheating, cheating bondage. You're cheating the flames of hell forever because of what Jesus has done for you. Accepting Jesus is accepting his perfect exam as your own. This is crazy. This is the gospel. Religion is trying to ace your own test. But the gospel is saying, I failed. I need a savior. And Jesus says, don't worry, I got you. I took it. Matter of fact, name on it. Matter of fact, I turned it in. All you need to do is accept it. And this test is yours. Congratulations. You just graduated into heaven. Come on, how many know that's good news? So we know that religion cannot save you, but Jesus can. Let's go now to point number two. Point number two, I, I titled it something different. Speaking the devil's language. Some will say, ooh, I don't like that. Speaking the devil's language. I'll say this. The devil wants you to partner with him through religion. The devil wants you to speak his language. He wants you to talk like him. And how does he do this? He does this when he can get you to be an accuser just like he is. If he can get you to, to accuse and to condemn and to beat people up all the time with your words, then he can get you to talk just like him. You sound just like your dad, the devil. That's not me. That comes from the Bible. That's a quote straight from Scripture. This is exactly what these Pharisees did in Matthew 15. They wanted people to obey religion, not God. They wanted people, and so they partnered with the devil and accusing people for not obeying their own man-made things, the law that could not save them. They accused people and beat them up for not obeying it, and they, and they ridiculed people even though it meant they would disobey God. They didn't care. They wanted people to obey their, their religion. It said in, in Matthew 15, verse 2, the Pharisees were saying, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they ate. You know when we act like the Pharisees? We act like them when we partner with the devil and we become, when we become accusers, not rescuers. I'll say that again. We act like the devil when you become an accuser, not a rescuer. 
The devil wants you, acu- wants you to accuse people the same way he does. I got an, I, I, an example really quick. Um, I just seen someone, uh, Ruben, come on up really quick. Actually, don't come all the way up. Well, actually, yeah, come up. Actually, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> come on on the stage, come on the stage. So picture me. I have the option right now to either be a, an accuser or a rescuer. And Reuben is someone, he's my brother in Christ. He's walking with the Lord. But Reuben, maybe he's, he's falling. He's falling to temptation. He's falling to something that, that's hurting him. I don't know what he's falling to. What are you falling to? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so he's walking. I want you to walk off the ledge there. He's walking all the way off the ledge, and then he falls. Go ahead and fall. Boom, and he's sitting down there at the ledge. You can sit down there. Now he's in his own murk. He's in his own filth. He's probably beating himself up right now. And I have one or two options. I can either stand up here and point at him and say, how dare you fall off of this cliff? You didn't see that cliff there? You made this decision. You know what? You're there because you deserve it. You made this choice. That's exactly where you should be. You knew a lot better, but this is exactly where you're supposed to be. Look at where you're at and look where I'm at. You should be more like me. That's an accuser. I stand above him and I point my finger and I talk just like the devil, pointing my finger and accusing my brother when he's down. How many of us have have done that? Maybe you don't tell them directly, but you say it behind their back. Oh, look at them. They fell. They deserve it. Oh, I can't believe them. Oh, man, look at, man, I knew it this whole time. I knew it. When in reality, God is saying, you're, God, is, God is revealing something right now. He's saying, don't talk like the devil. He's saying, talk like me. When you see your brother or your sister down, do not let them stay down, but rescue them. Rather than pointing the finger, I should be extending a hand and saying, I got you, brother. I know it's hard. I know it's tough. I know it's not easy. I was there before, but I can help you. It's okay. Because of the grace of God, you can get back up. And I got you. I'm right here with you. This is what God has called us to be. A rescuer, not an accuser. Give it up for Reuben. We speak God's language when we love others. And Jesus summarized all of this. He summarized the whole law by saying, you shall love God above all things and then love your neighbor as yourself. So this whole law that we're trying to live by, God is saying, you miss the law. You miss everything if you're not loving people and loving God. Galatians 6.1 says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Religion kicks people when they're down. But the gospel loves people back into position. This is how God has called us to live. Not like the Pharisees, but like Jesus. Jesus doesn't kick you when you're down. He calls you back up. Jesus doesn't declare that you're hopeless. He says, he says a righteous man may fall seven times but get back up. Jesus doesn't say you're a hopeless case. Jesus doesn't say you're worthless. As a matter of fact, Jesus says you're a special treasure. Jesus says that I will leave the 99 to go after the one. If you feel like you're lost, he said, I will leave it all for you because I love you this much. I will put my life on the cross for you. That's how much you mean to me. He loves you. And Jesus doesn't base your identity off your worst moment either. John 8, 10 Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? What woman is he talking about? He's talking about a woman that was caught literally in the act of adultery. A woman literally that could be, in this illustration, could be right there in her, in her filthiest, darkest moment. According to the law and the tradition of the time, everyone was supposed to, in the community, pick up a stone and throw them at her until she dies. They were going to stone her in public to death. That was her sentence. That's what she deserved. And the reality is, a lot of us deserve that for the mistakes we've made. But Jesus does not define you based on your worst moment. And he looked at this adulterous woman, and everyone had this stone. And Jesus came up and began to write in the sand. 
And Jesus began to tell all the, and they began to say all these things. And Jesus said, the first person that has no sin, go in and cast the first stone. And everyone had to drop their stones. Why? Because they knew they were a sinner just like her. So before we accuse anybody else, just remember, you got mistakes too. Before we tell, before we kick someone while they're down, just remember, you got maybe some skeletons in the closet you got to get out too. Let's remember what God has forgiven you from, and it'll give, it'll show you mercy and grace for the, your brother and sister next to you. So Jesus tells this woman, he says, where are your accusers? Where's all these people that are supposed to be accusing you? Where's all these people that are supposed to be pointing their finger at you? He says, didn't even one of them condemn you? She says, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Come on, that's good news for someone in here that feels like they've sinned one too many times to be loved by God. That's good news for someone in here that feels like they're a little too far gone for the love of Jesus Christ. That's good news for someone in here that feels like God doesn't care about you. God doesn't have a plan for you. I got good news for you. Jesus did not come to condemn you, but to save you, even if you're in your darkest moment. Come on, someone say, thank you, Jesus. My third point for you tonight is this, real worship versus fake worship. Jesus replies to these Pharisees, these Pharisees that are accusing the disciples of not washing their hands and they're putting these man-made traditions above obeying God and, 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 and they're really, they're trying to put on this facade like they're godly, but the reality is they're not. They're wearing a mask. So Jesus says something pretty harsh, pretty stern to them. Verse 7, we're in Matthew 15 still. Verse 7, he says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Fake worship doesn't honor God. What is fake worship? Well, our worship is fake or it's not real when it only comes from our lips and not our hearts. Now, what does that mean? Well, this word lips in this portion of scripture, when Jesus is saying, it's literally our mouth or spoken words. But another, another uh, definition of that word lips is the seashore. It's interesting. What does that mean? The seashore. Well, a lip worship tries to honor God only from the outside. A lip worship only tries to honor God from words or just from the shore. A lip worship, a fake worship is shallow. There's no depth. There's no realness to it. I don't go all the way in. I just, I'm right at the surface. I'm right shallow. And and I just want people to think that I'm worshiping God, but I'm not jumping all the way in with my heart. This This is the kind of worship that doesn't honor God. It's a fake worship. It's trying to keep the face of a godly person when in the inside you're living totally apart from God. I know this is a heavy Wednesday night, but this is something I believe that God is, wants to clean up in the church today. I believe that God is cleaning house right now, not just in church, but in churches all over America and the world. I believe God is looking for people that are ready to worship him in spirit and in truth. These are people that are saying, I'm trying to fake my worship to God. I'm not trying to wear the facade anymore. I want to jump all the way in the ocean and I want to stop living on the shore of God's goodness and his love for me. He says, your worship is a farce. Farce means something that's a mockery, a joke. Jesus is literally saying, Pharisees, your worship is a joke. Man, that's, Jesus, that's cold-blooded. He's speaking the truth. But here's the real worship. Real worship actually honors God. What does that look like? Our worship is real when it comes from the heart, not just our words. Worship is real when it comes from within us, not just from from out of us. And what does it mean? What is that word hearts? Well, that word hearts in in, in verse 7 literally means your passions, your desires, your appetites, your affections, your purposes and your endeavors, your emotions. 
Your heart is the innermost part of someone. So rather than being on the shore, you go to the innermost part. You're saying, I'm jumping all the way in with my heart, my affection, my appetite, my emotions, my desires. With all of me, I'm going to worship God, not just from my mouth, but from my heart. This is the worship that honors God. It's real. It's authentic. It comes from within you. See, God is only honored when it comes for that innermost part of you. God is not honored from the shore. God is only honored when our hearts match up with our words. God is honored when our words match up with our hearts. The Bible actually says in John 4, 23 through 24, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here right now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Worship team can come up. I don't know where he's at. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm going to say this. That word truth means this. It's something that's free from falsehood or deceit. When God is saying, I'm looking for people that worship me with no deception, what he's really saying is I'm, working, I'm looking for someone that's going to worship me authentically. Stop trying to fake God out. He knows you inside and out. He knows what you're going through. He knows your struggle. He knows your fight. He knows what's hurting you. He knows the pain in your heart. He knows who you have to forgive. He knows what keeps you up at night. He knows what steals your joy in the day. He knows all of these things. Stop trying to put on a show before God and tell God, God, I'm perfect. God, I'm okay. God, everything's fine. And God's saying, just worship me in spirit and in truth. Give me your good, your bad, and your ugly. Drop everything off at the altar at my feet. Let everything go before me. I'm a loving father, and I already know the inner workings of you. You do not scare me by what's going on inside. I love you. I'm not surprised by your sin. I'm not shocked that you're going through that. As a matter of fact, it burdens me to see you hurting and not let me help you. I want to set you free. I want to give you a new beginning and I want to show my love to you. Will you just stop trying to fake me out and will you just let me, just let me set you free? That's true worship. This is true worship before God. How can we honor God in this moment right now? How can we worship him honestly and truthfully in this moment right now? This is the final verse I'll share with you. Worship team, go ahead. Colossians 2, 13 through 14. You were dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Some people in here Your sinful nature has not been cut away yet. You're living with it, and you're actually dead inside because of your sin. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all all of our sins, and he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. This is the gospel. This is the power of God's love, the good news for you and I. That although you were dead, dead inside, you were literally the walking dead, God looked at you with love in his eyes. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the cross. To ace, he he sent Jesus to the earth to ace the test of life, to take your test. Not only take your test, but to go to the cross and pay your punishment. And he did all of this because he absolutely loves you. He loves you so much that he gave you his perfection, he gave you his love, he gave you his record. And now you're no longer dead because of your sin, but you can be made alive with Christ Jesus and forgiven of all of your sins. And tonight can be your night. I'm gonna ask you this question. As a matter of fact, just close your eyes right where you're at. Right there at your seat. 
I'm asking you a serious question right now. Are you right with God? And if you start thinking to the good things that you're doing, then I'm afraid to say you may be depending on religion. There's no amount of good you can do to make up for the wrong you've done. I'll ask again, are you right with God? The only way to be made right with God is by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, acknowledging him as your Lord and Savior. And then rather than just dipping your toe in the water, jump all the way in. See, God has given us a, 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 a powerful, powerful tool called repentance. Repentance is something that God created our, on our behalf, where we now have the option to turn away from your sinful, dead self, to give it to God and to turn to him for eternal life. So if in this moment you're saying, I'm, maybe you're nervous, maybe you feel your heart pumping, maybe you feel the draw, maybe you feel the tension inside of you saying, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do it, but I know I have to. Sometimes you have to make a decision before you feel like doing it. Tonight, if you're saying, I, I may not feel like it, I may not want to, but I know tonight's the night. I must turn from my old ways and I must give my life to Jesus. If you're ready to make that decision, if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, then the good news is that all of your sin can be wiped away in one moment and you can be given forgiveness and eternal life tonight. So I'm gonna count to three and if you're saying that's me, then I want you to raise your hand all across this room when I count to three. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this room. Just pop them up so I could see them. Pop your hands up. I see all of those hands. I see all of those hands across the room. I see all of those hands. I see you. I see you. I'm proud of you. Can you do me a favor? Let's all stand to our feet before anybody leaves. I want to make one more last call. If tonight you raise your hand as the prayer team comes up, altar team can come up right now. If you raise your hand, I want you to make a very bold decision right now with no shame. We're not going to kick you. As a matter of fact, we're reaching out right now and we're going to help you in this walk. If you're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus and you raise your hand, then I want you to make your way up here to the front. If you raise your hand, come out of your seat and come up to the front right now. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Don't turn back the other way, but come up to the front. And church, let's clap for every person that comes up. We applaud you. We're excited for you. We congratulate you. We love you. And we are not here to shame anybody. We're here to celebrate the decision. Come on, church. They're still coming up, which means we're still clapping. We're still clapping. We're still excited. Yes. Today's the day. Come on, he's good. Let's sing that one time before we go to worship. Come on, why don't we sing that, church? Sing to worship you one last time. We sing to worship. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. He's good. He's faithful. Now let's sing. Now listen. Everybody that came up here, just look at me for a quick second. We are going to help you in the swag. We have classes here. They're going to help you. It's a class called Starting at the Way. And what is it? What is this class about? It's going to show you, teach you what it means to be saved. And we're going to help you get baptized. Like the many people up here that got baptized and made that decision. I'm turning away from my old life and I'm turning to Jesus. We're going to help you in that walk. So jump all the way in. Tonight's the night. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you and they're going to help you get signed up. Aren't we excited for everyone that's making a decision to follow Jesus tonight? This is incredible. This is awesome. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Say, Jesus, thank you that you lived a perfect life for me. 
You died on the cross for me, but you also resurrected from the dead for me. You did this because you love me. So forgive me, Lord, from all my sin. I repent and I turn away from my sinful lifestyle and I turn to you tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a new beginning and a new life. I will no longer depend on religion to be saved, but I am depending on the good news of Jesus Christ, on what you did on the cross for me. I make you my Lord and my Savior, and my faith is in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God one more shout of praise tonight. Come on, how many received the word tonight and you're thankful? God is so good. Church, we love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. Don't forget tomorrow morning, we have a record expungement event. If you want to come to that, Saturday is Vision Masterclass with Pastor Marco. There are some tickets left. And Sunday, I believe, I believe Pastor Marco has a word for all of us. So let's get ready on Sunday. It's going to be incredible. Love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. If you need prayer, come up. Remember, God is for you. There's no one who can come against you. Have a wonderful night. God bless you.